Hi, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Phantom Podcast. As you all know, my name is Nabil Ahmed. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Phantom Foods, and we're a platform where we connect chefs, mixologists, and venues for private events. But we wouldn't be here without the hard workers, the future visionaries, and the operators within the industry. And today, we are blessed to have Turaj, the COO of Serve Robotics, uh, here with us to talk about his history, what got him into the scene, and where he thinks the future of food will be. So Turaj, before I mess anything up, why don't you give yourself an introduction that justifies the amazing experiences you've done? Oh, well, thanks for that kind introduction, Abiel. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, again, my name is Turaj Parang. Um, and uh, yeah, so well, I don't know how far back you want me to go, but uh, I'll go way back. <laughs> uh, so I, um, I studied at Stanford University as an undergrad. Uh, before that, I actually was an immigrant to the U.S., um, came from um, originally from Iran, then my family hopped around the world uh, a few times before we landed here in Southern California. Went to high school in the U.S., then went to Stanford for my undergrad, and that was my first exposure to the Bay Area, and I just fell in love with the technology, innovation, just the spirit of uh, entrepreneurship uh, in the Bay Area. But I was an immigrant, and I was a bit risk-averse at the time, so I kind of looked through all the career paths and tried to see, okay, what, what can... Uh, set me uh, for set me up for success in this new new land of opportunities and uh, legal professions seem to be really really attractive and mm-hmm. um and you know this is a country built on laws and i figured you know if, if you really want to really understand how to work the system you better know the laws and yeah. so i applied to law schools luckily i i got into uh, the ones I, I wanted to go to, and I went to Yale Law School. Um, it had a nice combination of the theoretical and the practical. And as an undergrad, I was a philosophy major. Uh, mm-hmm. So I had a penchant for the theoretical. Um, but I also balanced that with economics because I, I wanted to be also be able to earn a living. So I went <laughs> to Yale Law School, and I knew I wanted to come back to Silicon Valley. So as soon as I got my JD, I came back. I started practicing uh, corporate securities law at Wilson Sansini, where I got to really work with incredible entrepreneurs. And it was the heyday, it was late 90s. Um, so we were doing IPOs and M&A, multiple of them in a week, and uh, just kind of um, learned a ton. But I realized very early on that um, I wasn't truly happy uh, being the legal profession. I wanted to be closer to technology. I wanted to actually be more directly involved at the forefront of what's happening rather than sort of I felt like lawyers are coming in a little later in the game they come in they make sure everything is done right and proper and documented but but not really right there up front um, Mm -hmm. when when the the things are happening so I uh, uh, basically networked my way to a job at a VC firm, actually started a US office of a European venture capital firm called Early Bird. And I was like the first associate there. And uh, learned uh, how to invest, how to, how to be an entrepreneur from the VC perspective. And then finally, mm-hmm. I summoned up the courage in 2005 to start my first company. It was a mobile social network called Jackster, kind of like a telegram or whatsapp uh, before the smartphones were around mm-hmm. um, we got very popular raised a good amount of money from very top tier vcs um fortunately and fortunately we heard, hit the 2008 2009 downturn mm-hmm. and had to kind of uh, sell the company because we couldn't raise any more money at the time uh, for pennies on the dollar lots of good lessons learned lots of great connections made I'm very proud of the Jaxer alumni who are all doing fantastic things now. Um, and then I went on to do s- several other startups, um, uh, and m- most of them had something to do with the small business world. So mm-hmm. either websites uh, with webs.com or legal services with App Council, um, kind of focus on solving the small business problems. 
And then I uh, worked at GoDaddy for the past seven years before my current position in the corporate development and business development role there. And that GoDaddy is a massive uh, small business uh, platform that just empowers entrepreneurs from the idea phase. You know, mm-hmm. people know yeah. GoDaddy for the domain name. So it's like whenever you have an idea, you want to get, get the domain name, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but then GoDaddy has a lot more to offer. And part of what I was doing was to help GoDaddy bring more offerings to the table to small business, like telephony solutions or um, other things, uh, email and uh, a lot of other uh, products. Um, after GoDaddy, I joined Serve Robotics, which brings us to our current topic. Uh, mm-hmm. Serve Robotics is a food delivery startup using robots on the sidewalks, autonomous robots on the sidewalks doing food delivery. And this is uh, this was founded uh, by an entrepreneur whom I admire and love, um, a good friend of mine, Ali Kashani. In fact, we did a little project together, which he sold to Postmates. And he started the Postmates X division uh, wow. in 2017. And, the, uh, and that division soon pivoted to becoming a robotics, uh, uh, basically, project. Um, trying to figure out how do uh, you do food deliveries efficiently, safely, effectively using robots on the sidewalks. Mm-hmm. Um, and we can talk more about why yeah. we're sidewalks versus streets or drones, etc. Um, and, and, you know, like even in 2020, you know, sort of did over 10,000 deliveries of food deliveries for Postmates in LA wow. alone. So these robots kind of got up and running and, and they're, they've been delivering food since. And after the Postmates acquisition by Uber, um, uh, the team decided that it made sense to spin off Serve as an independent entity so that it could raise money, it could attract the right talent and grow um, and serve many, many others and other verticals, other industries, rather than just be within one uh, one company um, because it, the, the opportunity is massive for robotic yeah. delivery in cities and um, in, in local neighborhoods everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's that's what I've been doing for the past year. Yeah, well, it seems like you've done a lot, right? So psychology undergrad to getting into law school, which is small little philosophy, law school. Yeah, Yeah, philosophy, sorry, philosophy into uh, Yale Law School, which is not an easy feat to then saying, hey, you know, why don't I go into a venture, you know, VC firm uh, and connecting into there to starting your own company to then getting into uh, a little more corporate in the sense of, you know, go daddy. Maybe it wasn't corporate at that time, right? Uh, but yeah, but, I joined it before they went public, and but it was mm-hmm. big enough. I mean, it was thousands of employees, and that was actually my first ex- and and really my uh, the attraction go daddy has for me was to work at a bigger company to see mm-hmm. how actually a big company operates at that scale, which was fascinating. Yeah. Yes. So I would I would basically say you're a jack of all trades, right? You've seen kind of everything. You you know, early stage, you've built companies, you've raised money, you've been on the other end of the table, like you know, cutting the checks to to being in a larger company. So all of that kind of is accumulation to to how you can be where you are today. Is is kind of my assumption through a lot of these things, but. Are there still things that you pull from, from your early days to how you operate today? Yeah. And by the way, that's a very nice characterization. I, 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 I perhaps uh, another way to think of it is that I, uh, I don't like getting bored. So whenever I felt like I'm <laughs> learning something, I try to do something different. Um, uh, but yes, I, I would say I'm happy that I had the legal education. I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled that I had the philosophy and economics background. I mean, those, mm-hmm. I can't encourage uh, undergrads uh, highly enough to take like liberal arts, like even philosophy, because it is so relevant, despite being so theoretical and abstract seeming sounding. Um, it is so relevant for what we do as entrepreneurs, which is always trying to reimagine the future, right? Mm-hmm. Reimagine different concepts like De, uh, deconstruct different concepts and see how how the world could be different and and sort of question our basic assumptions and then the legal profession what it provides is 
a, a lot of work ethics. Um, uh, lawyers are amazing at immersing themselves in a new subject mm -hmm. and really trying to extract what is important and the key concepts and, and be able to um, uh, kind of step back, but also be very, very detail oriented. So that's something that I, I will always uh, use um, in my work uh, and uh, other, uh, you know, uh, endeavors uh, as a human being. Uh, so I, I kind of call the legal profession or law school like boot camp for the brain. Yeah. There were literally times that I felt like I could not read a word anymore. Like my brain was saturated. With <laughs> uh, like we have these thick, 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 thick case books. And um, uh, there's just a tremendous amount of uh, material you have to digest uh, through the course of uh, law school education. So not mm -hmm. for everybody, but those who go through it, all power to you. Yeah. So it, it almost looks like, hey, you know, when I think of legal and this might be just a, a, a brush assumption, right? It's looking at constraining what is. So it's almost past tense, right? It's like, hey, these are the things that we're allowed to do. These are the things that we can do. And maybe there's a little bit of future forward thinking and predicting what we need to build, right? But you paired that up with you know, uh, your philosophy, economics, where it's like almost these creative sides to where you're thinking about the future. And, and when I think of those two combined and what you're doing today, you are creating a future product with Serve Robotics, which is amazing, right? You know, tell me a little bit more on why this idea excites you and, you know, how is it getting traction in, in the marketplace? Because it, this is something out of the movies, in my opinion, right? Autonomous mm -hmm. delivery when it comes to the sidewalking, dealing with pedestrians, dealing with oncoming traffic, you know, moving forward, it, it's exciting to see. Yeah, in fact, in actually, when you look at our robots, the Serv robots, it's kind of like a hybrid between a Minion and Wally, -E, the cartoon, yeah. the Disney cartoon. Uh, so it's kind of, they, they are, they, they do look cartoonish or sci-fi-ish and yeah, the future is here. That's one of the common things we hear in on social media posts when people see our robots on the streets and they, they're very, very popular on TikTok and Instagram. Mm -hmm. So, uh, celebrities take selfies with them, <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting. Um, so yes, the, the, it, it is the future and it's the, I would say accumulation of a number of trends that have very recently come together. So one is the AI and machine learning that just, mm -hmm. we've had tremendous progress in those areas in the past couple of years. Um, we have with computer vision, for instance. Uh, so, um, and that's why, you know, you have Tesla's and you have other autonomous kind of uh, technologies all piggybacking on that. Then you have, um, hardware costs coming down, like with sensors, LiDAR costs coming down, uh, all these different sensors. Um, of course, the recent supply chain issues uh, mm -hmm. is a little bit of a um, uh, disappointment in that regard, but it's gonna, long term though, you can see that those costs are following Moore's law or whatever law it is that the, <laughs> their cost is coming down and they're becoming more and more powerful. Mm -hmm. So you have that. You have with the pandemic uh, an interesting societal change, um, which, like for instance, my wife pre-pandemic would never order groceries through an, an app, yeah. and then you know, three weeks into the pandemic, she started using that, and now she's doing it regularly. So this behavior change, this acceptance of on-demand delivery, uh, using apps to order various things, convenience items, groceries, food. Um, uh, so all these things coming together kind of uh, makes it ripe for uh, the robotic solution. Now, there are different ways to uh, come at it. There could be robots as drones, as vehicles, or as sidewalk robots, which is what we do. The beauty of sidewalk robots is that they have the least amount of risk in terms of posing safety mm -hmm. to pedestrians and to people. Whereas, you know, a car um, is a you know, as, as we know, it is a very, very dangerous yeah. um, thing and uh, anything can, slightest error uh, could, could be fatal. Mm -hmm. Whereas with a sidewalk robot that kind of walks at walking speed or even lower than walking speed, uh, you know, luckily, like for instance, for the past four years, we've been operating 
nothing serious has ever happened. Like maybe they have brushed up against someone, but nothing like no damage. They, they have never caused any damage, right? Mm-hmm. So that that's a big difference, and that's why you also see a lot of regulatory acceptance of cyber. Mm-hmm. Over twenty states now have actually issued legislation that uh, makes it much easier and much more streamlined uh, for their localities and municipalities to roll out these robots, which is fantastic for the industry. I wish all states would do that. Um, and uh, like we have never had much resistance from local um, cities um, with regards to what we are doing, which is very different with like, if it was a vehicle or um, other form factors. So yeah. there, we, we've we designed the, our robots to be very neighborly and very friendly. Mm-hmm. Um, and we approach the regulations as uh, in, in collaboration with the regulatory bodies because we actually can provide them information about their cities, sidewalks, the state of their sidewalks, their um, ADA um, requirements, et cetera, that they may, themselves may not have necessarily visibility into. So it's mm-hmm. a data sharing actually arrangement with a lot of these yeah. And what, what's really cool about this, and number one, if you guys haven't seen the robots, you should definitely take a look. They are quite nice looking. Like they almost make you want to Thank smile you. when you take a look at it, right? Um, but the interesting thing is, in you know, you guys are currently deployed in Los Angeles. Is that correct? And other cities? Yes, yes. Mm-hmm. in Los Angeles. We, we were operating in San Francisco a couple of years back. Right now, we are actually at the Valley Fair Mall in San Jose. Um, oh, nice. And the, the Westfield Mall there. Um, so, and we are expanding. We, we plan to be in many, many locations by the end of the year. Yeah, and and I almost look at it when I when I think of San Francisco and walking the streets. And this is just you know city versus suburb mindset, right? I I always look at oh that light is yellow. I should probably just start walking already, right? And not ab- abiding by the laws completely. But you know, there's a gray area in the sense of what we do from a city perspective, right? How troubling is that when the sense of variables when it comes to um you know having your robots run on the sidewalks right there's probably a lot of things you guys really need to take into consideration like people and uh, yeah. people biking on sidewalks and now you've got lime you know and you know different yeah. scooters and and mobility like micro mobility that might affect it but it's it's interesting how you guys are still deployed in a, a, a pretty dense urban city yeah yeah, no, absolutely. So, uh, and in fact, there are two ways actually um, you could you could approach the sidewalk uh, robotic issue. One is with teleoperation, which really means just you have a basically a remote controlled robot where somebody somewhere in the world uh, could be in the Bay Area, could be remote, uh, all the way in Mexico or Colombia, that's uh, driving the robot remotely. Mm-hmm. That's one way to go about it. The other way is to invest heavily in automation and uh, um, sensors and technologies that that enable the robot to be autonomous and to be like aware of its environment and to react in real time to its environment. We took the latter approach, the autonomous approach, because mm-hmm. we knew that if you have a one to one human to robot ratio, first of all, economically. You're never going to get the economies of scale. Yeah. It's a little bit of a labor arbitrage, but it's not a game changer. Um, and then secondly, and perhaps even more importantly, the safety issues. Like you need to be able to react in real time. Mm-hmm. And humans get distracted. They get tired. There's there's a lot of unknowns. And even uh, their connectivity may go down for a second. You know, So there are all these problems with a teleoperated robot where when you put them in public places and they're crossing streets and things like that, you want to rely less and less on humans and more and more on, on onboard intelligence of the robot. So we've invested that way. And, and to your point earlier, how do these uh, robots kind of interact? So they're, they basically are intelligent. They learn from every time they go out there. Uh, and, uh, you know, the if there are... Sp- hitting situations where they don't know what to do, they, they stop, <laughs> and and then a human can take over. And then we learn from that, and they get better the next time around. Uh, right now, for crossing the streets, we have very strict SOPs. Um, so, you know, we don't just go through a street. There are like many, many <laughs> yeah. things you do. You stop, you wait for the light to change. There's like 
the distance that you stop at, the speed at which you cross. There's a lot of um, things that go along to make sure you have a safe uh, interaction and, and uh, you're cognizant, like for instance, of people with wheelchairs, you're cognizant of kids on scooters. So all mm -hmm. those things, there's a, there's a lot of variables, as you said, and you're constantly learning and improving. Yeah, and I'm like almost forecasting this, or this is the future, is as you guys take more and more, let's say, uh, um, virality, right? Because you already have a pretty viral product, right? As you said on TikTok, I've seen it on TikTok too, right? Um, nice. and, and as more and more people get used to the idea of their food getting delivered autonomously, um, I would almost see this kind of pushing city infrastructure to almost better itself, right? There's those, there's effects or side effects to everything that you guys are doing in the sense of, you know, I, I look at some infrastructure within some cities and I'm like, wow, that sidewalk hasn't been fixed for a year and a half and it's broken, <laughs> you know, or this light is, is incorrect, right? So I think there's a bigger play with a lot of things that you guys are building, which is really cool. And I know at a stage of a company that you guys are currently at, you're focusing on solving one problem, but there's there's a lot of things that it could might solve. Is are those some of the things that you guys are actively thinking about when it yeah, comes absolutely. to building this company? Hundred yeah. percent. And in fact, you know that our, uh, we really uh, are proud of our collaboration with the city because it is that kind of information sharing. We do we do send them reports back. We tell them the routes we have gone and you know what we have encountered. So so yeah, there is that that. Uh, public-private uh, collaboration, which uh, we, we love uh, because it's it's uh, good for all the parties, you know, and mm -hmm. most importantly for, for local residents. Also, what is really beneficial for, for uh, uh, the local economy is that robotic delivery, because it's cheaper, because it's more available. Right now, we have actually a labor shortage uh, mm -hmm. in a lot of areas, especially peak hours and... Uh, dense urban environments where things can't get delivered uh, so people want to order from their local restaurant or local store but they just there's no availability or the delivery window is like one and a half hours so it's like who wants to wait that long yeah with robotic delivery that can become a lot more um, accessible the local venues merchants can become a lot more accessible and a lot more affordable when you don't have to pay more than your item that you're buying for the delivery cost um, mm -hmm. So um, there is that that benefit to local business, especially those that have been hard hit by the pandemic. Th that's amazing, and that that's what we we hope that not only serve but also everybody else in this space enables. Yeah, they, and it's funny you say that. That's one of our core reasons for creating the business Phantom Food is how do we enable more kind of small mom and pop the people who work there. Or the people who have been furloughed during, you know, the, during the pandemic, or restaurants that have been shut down, to kind of level people up. And I definitely think your product, when it comes to a transportation perspective, will allow people to not only eat what they they want to eat at a lower cost, right? Because the prices are ridiculous. But there's the ability of transporting not only food, right? It's like the simple essentials that you need in a city. Or you know, I'd almost see these you know, helping support, you know, maybe some small disasters within a city and you can't necessarily get to it by a car, right? So this is what's really interesting about the product. I think it's endless in the sense of what you're doing and there is this core sustainability play, right? It's almost an enablement versus taking people's jobs is, is how I view the business. It's definitely growing the local economy. And as you said, it is also very beneficial for the environment um, because, you know, the, they don't use gas. Um, mm -hmm. And they also um, are reducing congestion and noise pollution. And also, you know, every car that's on the street, that's a safety hazard. So they're actually making cities safer. Um, mm -hmm. So there are all these other positive externalities that comes with, uh, a robotic uh, solution, a delivery solution. So, yeah, I, I'm very, very uh, optimistic about um, this industry and and all the benefits that it can unleash for us. Mm -hmm. Where do, Where do you think the future is? If you're If you're allowed to um, disclose where you're going to take serve robotics and what's the well, bigger I, vision? 
Yeah, you know, for us, the immediate kind of the near term or mid term business, I of course, have these build as many robots as we can and put them in as many places as we can, right? So US uh, and as well as other countries. Um, so that's that's the immediate first. But then we, we believe that there's even other form factors and other ways that perhaps our technology or solution can help expand human capabilities really um, using robotics, right? Robots are here to serve humanity, mm-hmm. serve robotics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So we are here to serve humanity and we want to make sure that our technology does exactly that. And um, uh, we don't want to be constrained um, by uh, our imagination, so to speak. We, we want to make sure that our technology can be out there. And it is important for robots in public places. Um, it's very different, right? When you have a, like a Roomba vacuum or something like that, it's it's very confined space. It doesn't mm-hmm. have those uh, other unknowns that it has to interact, but in public places, uh, I think it's a whole different mindset, both operationally as well as how you develop the technology that you need to be cognizant of, and uh, yeah, we want to be um, uh, be at the forefront of that. Yeah, I've got an interesting question here. If from the data that you've seen in LA, what's the most common meal that's been ordered? Do you have insight into that? That is a very interesting question, and I wish I had the answer, but I have not yeah. looked into that. Huh? Well, yeah. I would say, you know, statistically speaking, it would be the same as, you know, uh, it would be for any platform like Uber Eats or Postmates. So mm-hmm. I'm not sure what the most common. It's probably different by neighborhoods too, right? Yeah. So, uh, in fact, that's a super interesting question. I have to go. I have to yeah. go do something. The- the the reason I I say is like you know we're booming in a like a food tech and food delivery is is, is a growing market right and and people are trying to reduce the time to where food is getting delivered to you so there's businesses that are starting up where they'll have instead of a kitchen being the base they'll put their kitchen into uh, like a food truck and the food truck will park in a specific area. And then it would shed off, you know, hot delivery to specific locations for closer things. And then there's companies where they half bake the pizza at base and then they have their cars equipped with ovens where they're cooking the other half so that you're getting the food very warm. So when I think of sort of robotics, I almost think of these variations, right? Like, you know, Domino's coming to you and saying, hey, we want to make Domino specific autonomous you know, robots that can carry pizzas while cooking them for the future. And so that's where I was trying to get the inside scoop so we can uh, let our listeners start building businesses around your infrastructure, right? That would be really awesome to see. Yeah, that is really interesting. And then there are, yes, uh, getting more closer to um, to the neighborhoods where the uh, volume of demand is and be able to provide the freshest experience. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think you, you've hit it on on a couple of very important points, both fast as well as good quality, right? Um, if you can, you can have the, both of those together. It's uh, tremendous. So, yeah, I think there's a lot of opportunities to come there. And I think there's also, um, you know, you have now these Pistro machines, which are, you know, they make pizzas, yeah. uh, robot, robots that make pizzas. In fact, we have a collaboration with them. They're kind of exploring ways we could, um, we could have them load their pizzas into robots and then deliver it right so mm-hmm. so definitely kind of robot to robot handoff itself is an interesting problem to solve uh and uh yeah there's a lot more coming that way yeah well Turaj, i appreciate all of the time you you've given me and our audience today i loved the conversation around everything from your history to the business to where the future is heading uh, but I always like ending this with, you know, if there's one thing you want to let our listeners know about you or the, the future or, you know, how do they get in touch with server robotics or how do they know when it's coming to a city to them, uh, let us know, right? Um, oh, absolutely. Well, thank you, Nabi. It was fantastic uh, uh, to talk to you and uh, I enjoyed this conversation very much. Uh, we are growing and expanding and if any of your listeners are thinking about joining the robotic revolution, please do check our career page at servrobotics.com. Yeah, I love that. And I can't wait to take advantage of it. I think for a lot of our phantom events, 
I would love to have a serve robotic robot come through and, and say hi, but you know, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> you let me know. Happy, happy to help. Yeah. Thank you again to Raj. I'll talk to you soon. Talk soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.